Perhaps unsurprisingly, Jade was late to school the next day. There's really only so much a Garu buddy can take. As far as I know, she didn't drink much. Don't look at me like that. But also, like, stop pretending you never drank at 16. But a moot is a big party that ends with bloody teeth and bloody claws. That's enough for anyone to sleep in the next day. But she had a job to do for us, in addition to homework she had barely touched. Fortunately, her mom, Jill, was already gone by the time she was able to form a coherent thought. She quickly cobbled together something resembling breakfast, dreaming of Molly's cuisine back on the set, I'm sure. Being an hour after the boss, she had to run to school. It would have been a breeze in lupus, but she couldn't afford to do that. We could only buy one set of clothes to her spirit itself, and she couldn't exactly wear those every single day. Besides, she'd still have to carry her backpack anyway, so she ran. She'd missed math, but had made it in time for phys ed, which is when she got her first clue. While in the locker room, changing for class, she overheard friends of Vicky kind talking. Vicky, as you recall, had been the original Gorham. Jane hadn't really spoken to them since. I mean, what do you say to your school's mean girl squad when the lead girl turned into a slasher, killed your crush, and then you killed her because, plot twist, you're actually a werewolf? So, she didn't approach them, but she listened. Apparently, some USB keys were being passed among the cool kids. Kind of like when I was in school. We'd pass along the tapes of some violent anime, but the videos in those files were apparently not fictional. These allegedly showed real scenes of torture and death. Just the kind of thing a future Gorehound might be into. It really was worth investigating, but Jane wasn't exactly one of the cool kids. Over the next few days, she tried to get closer to people in the know and pretend to care about the newest fad. But she wasn't up to speed on most things a teenager might consider important, and she couldn't exactly bring up, hey, have you heard the latest gossip from the spirit world? She needed an inn. She just couldn't find it. So the inn found her instead. She was at the cafeteria, listening intently at a conversation two tables over as a wild food tray suddenly appeared. The tray was accompanied with a human she knew, Edith, the second gorehound, the one we cleansed before she could fully give in to the worm. Thank you, the girl said. Uh, what? asked Jane uncomfortable. No, I've, um, I've no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, you do. I, I, I don't understand. I'm scared. I'm fucking scared. What the hell was that? In my head? In my mind, she stopped herself, looking around. People had begun to stare. Listen, Edith, I can't explain it, the cop offered as kindly as she could. I figured you couldn't. But you can still help with something else. Can, can you meet me there, where it happened? Can you be there tomorrow after school? question lingered for a while. Jane felt cornered. This could be a trap. She didn't know how Edith began her journey to corruption. Accepting might well start her own similar journey. But then again, what else could she do? What better opportunity could there be to find out what had happened? Of, of course, she finally answered. I'll be there, for sure. When school was over, she was scheduled to meet with the school's counselor, Mr. Irwin, but she couldn't focus. The fact was, she couldn't wait to talk to us about Edith's request. How are you feeling? Mr. Irwin would ask, in the typical counselor fashion. Uh, oh, uh, honest, um, honestly not great, she said, using the truth to hide her lies. I'm very distracted, and I, I sleep too much. I was late twice this week. Yes, I heard as much from your teachers. Listen, Jane, you went through an intensely traumatic experience. You need time to heal. You need time to grieve. Society, it, it's sick. 
They give you a week off school and now you're expected to be okay about what happened? You're supposed to just be back here and on time? Hell no, little lady. You need time for yourself. You need time to... And I have no idea what else he said. Neither does Jane. Look, I wasn't there, <clears throat> but the point is neither was Jane. Physically, she was present in the room with him, but her mind was reeling with questions and doubt. About tomorrow, about her place within Garu society, about weird skeletons, squirrels gaining wisdom by being eaten by howls somehow, and walking from the next world back to, well, not even this world, but the Umbra. As she was fond of saying, it was a lot. Do you get what I'm saying? Asked the counselor, untold, unknown, amounts of time later, breaking her trail of thoughts. Uh, no, no, not, not really, no, she replied honestly. Mostly because she wasn't listening, but he didn't need to know that. Listen, can we, can we postpone? I'm sorry, but I need to go home. Of course, it's okay. Don't think I didn't notice you letting me do most of the talking today, though. Next week, you need to open up to me, okay? Yeah, yeah, all right, I'll, I'll do that. With that whole affair squared out, the cub ran out of the office and back to her room, dropping her stuff. Then she ate with her mom and pretended to be normal until Jill left for her graveyard shift, leaving Jane alone again. Exactly what she was hoping for, turned out. She changed into her dedicated clothes, waited for the sun to be down, and padded over to the sept on all fours. As she reached the barn, she sat on her haunches, lifted her head, and let out a howl of introduction. Jane, come. Therge and Pupil of Sarah Suncaller. As soon as she was done, she screamed in terror. Right next to her came another howl. Firehound, Ragabash of the Northern Expense Pack and member of Little Brother's tribe. Jesus, Firehound! How long have you been there? She croaked in the Garu Tong. Here? We just got here, replied the wolf. We just got here? You followed me from my house? No. I've been with you all day. I do not like your school. Everyone talks. It's loud. All day? Why? Protection. T to be clear, we didn't spy on Jane. She knew we took turns to escort her when we could spare the time, just in case the Black Spiral dancers were on her tail. She just hadn't realized that Firehound, a frickin' huge, bright, white wolf, had been sneaking around her school while people were in it. You... you protect me? Even in there? Yes. How? I am Ragabash. The spirits help me stay out of sight. And when I can't, I adapt. You adapt? She asked quizzically. I have a homage-shaped tool, and I have a trick. I pretend to wash the floors. Sometimes I don't even have a broom. Oh, okay then. Good to know I have backup if things go south. Is the pack in? I have news to share. Once they were allowed in, Jane brought Gloria and Firehound up to speed, but I was nowhere to be found. We'll be there with you. Don't worry. Gloria reassured her. I'll let Sarah and the elders know, but Horus should be there too. He's not in tonight. Firehound, can you track him down and take her to him? As a response, the wolf turned around and left, his body language clearly already on the job of picking up my scent. It took them a while to reach me. When they did, I was alone, talking to myself in the house where Jane had learned to shift into Krynos. The city was still picking up the debris after Gloria had crashed the whole thing on the Black Spiral Dancer Pack. What are you doing back here? She asked me. Uh, that's, that's a complex question, I said. But a very, let's say, convenient one. There's something I need to talk to you about. Oh boy, here we go again. 
Jane found as comfortable a spot as she could find and sat. All right. So you know all about breeds and auspices by now. Some of us are born as wolves, humans, or something in between. Depending on which phase of the moon is in the sky at the time of your birth, you belong to one of five auspices. You are either a questioner of the way, a mystic, a judge, a storyteller, or a warrior, right? You remember all that? She nodded. But there's another thing that defines us. A vital part of who we are. Our tribes. Contrary to what you may believe, a tribe isn't just a question of blood. While there is a tendency for cubs to join the tribe of their parents, at the end of the day, the spirit patron of the tribe makes the final call. She held up a finger to stop me. Hold on, she said. So what's my tribe? You knew my auspice right away. Do you know my tribe too? I don't. Because you don't have one yet, I replied. When cubs are ready, we give them a test. It's called the rite of passage. If you succeed, then you get to request acceptance into a tribe. You can ask for acceptance in just about any tribe. Hopefully, a spiritual patron will take you in, and hopefully, it's going to be the one you asked for. Some of them are very picky. Others just have very specific standards. For example, you can't join the Red Talon tribe because Griffin does not accept Hamids. Why the hell not? She asked, puzzled. Oh boy, that is such a loaded question, and a story for another time. But I'm glad you're curious. See, most cubs get about a year to learn stuff before they get thrown into the deep end of the rite of passage. But you, you're already in the field with us. So I spoke with the elders, and they've agreed to consider what you're doing now as your rite of passage. Over the next few days, I'm going to arrange for you to speak with members of each tribe. This is important. When the time comes, you need to know which one you want to try and aim for. Your tribe is going to color how a lot of Garu sees you, and different patrons will have different expectations of you. Not to mention, tribes usually have a pretty strong opinion on how things need to be done, so it's important to end up somewhere you'll be comfortable, surrounded by like-minded people. For example, the children of Gaia, like Sarah, usually favor being pacifists whereas they get a Fenris value strength above all. Sure, she said, but what does any of that have to do with why you are alone in the middle of a destroyed building? I smiled. What makes you think we're alone? I... What? She said, taken aback. Let me tell you about us, the Silent Striders. It would all make sense soon enough. I'm sure a lot of people, when they talk about their tribes, they go into a long-ass history lesson, but I can't do that. See, our history was stolen. I see the question in your eyes. Cub, I told you, it will make sense in time. For now, know this. Most werewolves don't need to worry about forgetting their past. All of them can easily talk to those who came before them. Ancestor spirits dwell within a deep realm in the Umbra called the Ancestral Homeland. Every tribe has one. The other tribes, they can spend a moment and channel these spirits, directly conversing with the past, or at least with those who lived it. But us, some 5,000 years ago, we were cursed by an ancient evil. We can never, ever reach our ancestral homeland or summon those who rest there. Which is ironic as hell, considering there wouldn't be ancestor spirits at all without us. Here is one story we know well enough that I can tell you. Long, long, long ago, before the gauntlet, when the physical and spiritual were one and the same, death was a fleeting concept. Most things didn't die at all, or reformed like the spirits do. This was a problem, in a way, because you can't just keep adding things to creation. Everything can't coexist all at once. You need entropy to have balance. When the weaver began to define the world, reigning in the wild's endless creation, so too did the worm get to work. 
making sure the dead stayed this way, all in the name of balance. All was as Gaia decreed. During that great change, when death was new, a young Garou felt grief for the first time. She went looking for her deceased parents, whom she missed dearly. Not knowing where to go, she asked for help, but no one knew how. Death was unique and mysterious. Still is, really, at least to all but Howl, who offered to guide her on her travels. Together they traveled far into the Umbra, until they were so deep the colors could not follow them. Here the shades of the dead were locked behind a great gate no one had ever seen before. The Garu gave the guardian protecting it a taste of life in exchange for opening it. The guardian, a surprisingly charitable fellow, agreed. Along with her parents, she could take back anyone else who wished to return. Very few did, for they were afraid and confused, but she did successfully rescue her parents and a few more. Traveling back home, she was separated from the other shades. Only her Garu parents were able to keep close. Those lost shades would become the first wraiths, which you might call ghosts. Trapped in a layer of reality not quite this world, not quite the next one, and not quite the Umbra. A place we call the Dark Umbra, where the dead who cannot transcend gather to this day. As for her parents, she took them all the way back home. Now that they knew the way between life and death, they could travel between them back and forth. They would become the first ancestor spirits, able to appear before the Garu to aid us in our times of need. But alas, they could not stay for long. The world had changed. Death was needed and Gaia would not allow it to be ignored. So they left for the ancestral homelands. That Garu, we do not know her name. That too was stolen from us, but she was the first of us. She was the first to be guided by Howl on her travels. Even then, we were all about umbral quests and speed. You try to keep up with a bird while it's flying between layers of reality. Good luck. In time, like most tribes do, we gathered and settled in one location. For us, that was Egypt, on the lush banks of the Nile. We shared that land with other shifters, the werecats and the were-crocodiles mostly. It was as green and flourishing a place as you could ever find on Earth. But it was also harsh, for life hung by the will of the floods, a cycle of life and destruction in perfect balance. But before you shoehorn us as the Egyptian tribe, know that we hail from everywhere now. We have kin in Asia, we have kin in the United States, in Europe, Africa, we have kin everywhere. Ours are the kins with wanderlust, who travel the roads as truckers, roadies, or even traveling salesmen. But yes, Egypt was a big deal. It was our home. Hal teaches us to be travelers, explorers, and to seek the unknown. So we set out to do just that. From him and through our own journeys, we learned the secrets of the world and those of the Umbra. No one, and I mean no one, is as well traveled as we are on either side of the gauntlet. If you're going somewhere, you want one of us to guide you there. But that's not all the secrets he has urged us to seek. Remember when I told you we were the ones who got a bunch of ghosts lost? Well, now the dead get lost all the time. Perhaps because the first of us went beyond the gate, or Perhaps it just comes from our link to how who watches over the restless, I don't know. But for whatever reason, we can see and hear the dead who haven't moved on. Anyone who dies with unfinished business and a strong enough will to do something about it becomes a wraith. So we learn their secrets too. Not in a creepy necromancer vibe way. We use what we know to help them move on. You could say we became their messengers. You'd be surprised how often an unfinished business is just letting someone know how they were loved or forgiven. I've once delivered a very heartfelt fuck you from beyond the grave. That was weird, but it worked, and the shade moved on. We even learned how to go there, you know, the dark umbra, where the lost souls wander. 
we only go there in cases of emergencies, but we can't. That place is bleak and dangerous beyond what I could convey with words. You would not believe me if I tried. I paused without meaning to. I was just reflecting on the past, but it came off as a dramatic pause, so I let Jane believe that I was cool. That is the coolest thing ever, she said, confusing sensational ghost stories from some fictional TV show with my very real dramatic life of helping one dreary dread folk after another and another, but I let her believe we were cool. I mean, sue me, I like it when folks think I'm cool. So, she asked, if things were going so well, what happened? We made enemies, I answered. Oversimplification of the fucking millennium, but I had to start slow. To us, the cycle of life and death was sacred. We believed it important that dead things remain dead. So when immortal gods began messing with that, things went south real bad. Osiris, yes, that Osiris, working with his wife Isis, yes, that Isis, managed to create this spell of life, giving dead souls the power to bind a body and return to life, resurrecting over and over again what you might call mummies. We went to war with them. And then Sotek used the power of blood to create vampires. We went to war with them too. In the middle of all that, mages took sides and it all became a huge huge mess. After long, long years of war and strife, one of us, a strider named Shuhorus, and one of them, a sorceress, called Nephthys, managed to lay low the god Sutek. Her magics empowered Shuhorus with the powers to rival even a god. As they fought, Shuhorus's pack weaved together a mighty ritual to forever bind Sutek in death. They were successful, but not before the fiend uttered a curse, binding it to the names of our most prominent heroes. And there are few things more powerful than a name. By the names I have spoken, O lupines, I curse you. I place my mark upon you, that you shall forever be severed from thy dead fathers and mothers. I damn you with my touch, that never again shall you rest in the lands of thy people. May the names of your ancestors be forgotten, and may their ghosts fade from hunger in the duat. As I was cast out, so then shall you be exiled, voiceless and lost forevermore. And just like that, it was over. Not, not the war, no. His vampiric children still hate us to this day, which we return in kind very much and very often. But us, our own, with that curse, the blood god made it impossible for us to stay here. We can no longer find sleep there. We are hunted by strange banes and our ties to the land are so broken we can't even recharge our spiritual energies. Worst of all, even outside of Egypt, we can no longer contact our ancestors. Many have even tried to travel the Umbra to find our ancestral homeland, but no one has ever succeeded. We lost Egypt. So we spread absolutely everywhere else. And everywhere we went, we made ourselves useful. And we made damn sure to respect everyone's territories. Because of that, today we're still the only werewolves from the Garu Nation, at least, to be tolerated by the Engeokai, who rule over Asia. The, the, the what now? She asked with wide, wide eyes. Yeah, okay. That's going to be for another time. But the Garu Nation isn't the only group of organized shapeshifters. The Engeokai have Asia. They are composed of many different werefolks, in addition to werewolves. And then there's the Ahadi in Africa. They're relatively new, also composed of different kinds of shifters. The rest of the entire world is ours. The Garu Nations, I mean. And, uh... 
we went to war with the other shifters, so those that are left here kind of hate us, so it's just us wolves. But the point is, Simon Striders can ride the lines between all of those. We're tolerated in all territories because we know how to be respectful. We're useful and we don't cause trouble. One of our biggest tenets is don't be an ass. We live in other people's lands often off of their generosity. Don't be a bad guest and don't judge. See, we were already the messengers of the dead. So it wasn't a big stretch for us to become everyone's messengers. It's very rare for a strider to stick with one set, like I do here. I'm an oddity among my tribe and even so, to be honest, I don't know how long I plan to stay here. Long enough to get you through this thing with the dancers, don't worry, but after that, the pack and I will probably get on the road again. Anyway, that's what striders do. We travel from one cairn to another, exploring all the lands in between while keeping an ear on the ground for signs of trouble. When we find some, we make for the nearest group of werewolves. They extend us hospitality, and we keep them up to speed on all the things going on with the other Cairns, and we let them know what we found out. Usually, we stay long enough to help fix whatever problem we found before moving on again. Rinse, repeat, ad nauseum. That's our life. Why, though? She inquired. Can't news be shared online? Too dangerous for the veil, I answered. And some septs are just too deep to have power anyway. Some seps just don't want power, so they have us instead. And forums can't scout the deepest corners of the darkest forests, caves, lakes, jungles, and boardrooms of the world. We provide an essential service that can't be provided elsewise. There's also the problem that even if we wanted to, we just can't stay in one place very long. See, back in Egypt, we kept the wraiths in check, but... I mean, there are 7 billion humans on Earth, and a large amount of them die every minute. We can't save that many dead folks. We just can't. And frankly, there's too much bad shit going on in the world these days. We just don't have time to deal with them. Which doesn't stop them asking. Wherever we go, as soon as one of them figures out we can see and hear them, it's over. They never stop asking us to find their killers, help a loved one, finish a project, hide a secret, or avenge their deaths. And once you help one, you can bet they'll let their friends know we did. And before you know it, you're never alone. You can't sleep. It never ends. So, we pick up our things and we leave. It's sad. It's cruel, even. It breaks my goddamn heart. But what else can we do? Her eyes brightened up for a second, then darkened with fear. Oh. My. God. Is that why we're here? Are you doing something for a ghost? Kinda, I replied. Last time we were here, I felt a presence. Gloria may have dropped the roof on the place, but that only happened because I took us here, so... Now, because of that, a wraith has lost something important. One of only two things that keep them anchored into this world. As a result, their existence, their very soul is in jeopardy, and it's my fault. So, yeah, I'm here to help. There's a ghost right now. Here, her eyes widened. Yes, more or less patiently waiting for me to be done so we can return to business. And by more or less, I really must emphasize that less, but what else is new? I'll deal with him when you're gone. But don't be afraid. You're in no danger. Ghosts are... safe? She asked. Oh, fuck no. Ghosts are terrifying. And they deal with monstrous cosmic bullshit that would scare a Garu's skin off their backs. You do not want to end up in a Wraith's bad side. This one I've been talking to for a while. He's not happy, but he'll wait until I'm done. If you say so, she did not seem convinced. Anything else I should know about Striders? 
Yeah, I guess. Socially speaking, most people like us, so there's not a lot to worry about. But there are some who look at us as cute. See, most people think we're loners just because we're travelers, but that's not true. My pack travels with me. They knew what they were getting into when we decided to join forces. Most often than not, that means we'll be in an all-strider pack or a nomadic pack, but folks still think of us as loners, and that's a big no-no among the Garou. Packs are our strength. It's our big advantage. No one in their right mind would be without one, so we're often seen as odd, off, weird, possibly insane. Oh, yeah, one more key thing. Names. Most tribes have a thing for names. Most of them earn a deed name, based on their personality or something that happened during their rites of passage. For example, we call Sarah Suncaller. Sarah is her regular, human-given name, and Suncaller is her deed name. We go a small step beyond that. We also get a remembrance name. That one we choose ourselves. Do you remember when we met? I said Horus wasn't the name that I was born with. That's because I chose the remembrance name Horus when I joined the tribe. What for? She pondered. Ritual, mostly. A lot of folks don't use their remembrance names outside of rites and ceremonies. Others like me use it all the time. For me, it's a protection thing. There is power in names. This way I make sure my enemies never know my real name. All right, that should cover the basics enough, I think. I should get back to my restless friend. It's best you leave for the moment. I'll be here a long while more. But we'll see you after school tomorrow to meet with Edith. Don't worry. We've got you. This has been A Right to Remember, Season 2, Episode 3. A series of lore videos for Legacy Werewolf the Apocalypse presented through an immersive narrative. The Silent Striders. My favorite. They're all about mystery and adventure, exploring the world, discovering secrets, talking to wraithly and spiritual beings about the meaning of life and death, helping the unfortunates find their way, and you get to look dang good doing it. They are as amazing as they are confusing. Wait, what? I said what I said. It's unfortunate that they keep being retconned and random crap just keep being piled on them like... The writers didn't think a cool Anubis-shaped tribe that talks with the dead wasn't a concept enough. In the first edition, they were presented as exclusively loners, and people distrusted them because of that. In the second edition, suddenly it's all, what? Oh no, we're not loners, silly. That's a misconception. We just stick to nomadic packs. In the episode, I presented a version that included the interesting bits of both, but you should feel free to play with whatever version works best for you. Just be warned, having a player always doing stuff on their own is usually not great for a table. Then there's the curse. <sighs> it's like five writers all designed a version of it and then couldn't decide on what to use, so they kept them all. Ooh, ooh, maybe they can't sleep in Egypt. That's good. Or maybe they can't regain Gnosis in Egypt. Sick. Or maybe they can't have the ancestor background. Nice. Oh, oh, or. Whenever they are inside Egypt, they are tracked and attacked by a unique bane. Oh my god, gang. Oh, oh, and they can talk to ghosts. Wait, ghosts aren't even mentioned in the words of the curse we wrote. Never mind that. Let's do it all anyway. No. And by the way, if you're confused about the bane one, that's because it's only referred to in one book, Rage Across Egypt, because God forbids everything you need to know to play a tribe should be in their tribe books. That said, I highly recommend ignoring that thing. It makes exactly zero sense. I don't care how powerful a vampire Sutek was. There's no reason his curse should spawn a whole new kind of Bane. Why would he even know about Banes and the Umbra at all? Now, say your character was born from Theanistock with a great rating in Ancestors. But your rite of passage happens and Hal shows up. Do you lose access to your Ancestors? Do you suddenly hear dead people when you couldn't before? As far as I know, there is no clear canonical answer to that. But I can give you an educated guess based on the Book of Apocalypse. 
the last book in the game line before W20. That book posited that you could affect the entire tribe by affecting its patron spirit. For example, in one of the four end of the world scenarios, an entire tribe fell to the worm because its patron did. Based on that, I'd say if the concept of the tribe is cursed, then Ao is cursed. And if you join a tribe, you'll be affected too. What if you're born from a strider parent and get chosen into another tribe? The text referring to the Garu born in the revised tribe book specified that the Garu born all have to curse and keep it even if they join another tribe, implying that Lupus and Hamid are different. My assumption is that it can go either way and that it's best left to the storyteller. One more weird thing they tacked on the striders that is best ignored is the tribe weakness. Tribe weaknesses were an optional system from an early edition that gave all the tribes a drawback. You'd think the curse would be theirs, but yet another writer decided to pile another weird quirk on top of everything else. The weakness is that they attract ghosts whenever they fail to cross the gauntlet. Now, how would a ghost have a clue what the gauntlet is, let alone feel? when a Silent Strider, and specifically a Silent Strider, failed to cross? To make matters worse, it left a lot of people with the misconception that that was the Strider curse. Like I said, the tribe is very much the coolest, but it was very messily handled. Which takes me to W5. They're great, and also, they are terrible. To explain that, I need to give you context. In W5, you are a random person who happened to be chosen and can now shapeshift. Another random person arrived and explained the basics. Fight the worm, yada yada. After that, you either joined that person's pack or was left to your own devices where you presumably found another pack down the road. There's zero guarantees you'll even get involved any further at all than that with Garu society. The setting just isn't built to encourage or lead to it. The game just assumes you will care about that anyway. The game even has a little sidebar saying as much. Which is why the Silent Striders are more important and essential than ever before as the glue that makes the setting work. The Striders are still the messengers and scouts, but now, they're also intermediary and mediators between sets and pockets of werewolves. They are an excellent way to bring an otherwise isolated group of werewolf into the fold of the Greater Garu community. At the very least, connecting them to other pockets, which may include bigger and more traditional sets. They are fantastic, both as NPCs and as player characters, getting involved in multiple sets' politics, and I really dig that. But. That curse, y'all. We went from five different definitions all piled onto each other of that curse to none. It literally just says that they are cursed and don't remember the details. It doesn't explain the curse in any way, shape, or form except to say that it somehow led to them getting on the roads. Their patron's ban mentions something about preventing the return of the banes responsible for the curse by honoring ghosts. So we know it ties to death and that's it. As a result of that ban, the striders now must perform commemorative rituals for anything that they witness dying. Do you know how many things a Garu sees dying? Often in quick succession. So what? A strider is expected to bury and ritually send off an entire hive of black spiral dancers they just helped a bunch of local packs dispatch? Really? And what does the curse do? No clue! What happens if a strider stops moving? No clue! Who the hell thought this was enough information to include in the book? No clue! What happens in next episode? Oh, actually, I know that one. We're going to take a look at the Children of Gaia tribe and getting in trouble at school. This episode is dedicated to my cats, Lika and Goblin, and to my father. All of their stories ended during the year and a half it took to write season two. Lika was just the cutest little thing in all the world. I know I checked. 
She disliked our other cat and she hated our dog, but she loved us with all of her tiny heart. She was always so patient with her humans, who were always gushing and squishing her with way more affection than she wanted. She always came when we whistled a series of specific notes. No other notes, mind you, no. She had a call that was hers alone, and she never failed to answer it. Goblin was my pal, my bestie. For the better part of 16 years, he lay on my chest every single night, purring until he got tired of me moving too much and jumped to his side of the bed. It's still weird to sleep without you, buddy. I really fucking miss you. My father was simultaneously a simple and complicated man. At times, he made my life easier, but at others, he made it incredibly difficult. But through it all, there was never any doubt that he loved us and that we loved him. I wish I'd known how to be closer to him, but I never figured it out in time. Their stories have ended. May Hal watch over them as they travel to the next leg of their journey. They are remembered and sorely missed.